NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang just dropped a legendary interview. Check this out. So one of the things I find mysterious, right? You know, you just mentioned Oracle 300 billion, Colossus, what they're building. We know what the sovereigns are building. We know what the hyperscalers are building. You know, Sam's talking in terms of trillions. But of the 25 sell side analysts on Wall Street who cover your stock, if I look at the consensus estimate, right. it basically has your growth flatlining starting in 2027, 8% growth 2027 through 2030. That is the 25 people and their only job, they get paid to forecast the growth rate for NVIDIA. So clearly, we're, we're comfortable with that. Right. <laughs> look, we're comfortable with that. But, but, we have but, no trouble beating right. the numbers on a regular basis. Right. Okay. No, I understand yeah. that. But there is this interesting disconnect. I hear it every day on CNBC and Bloomberg. And I think it goes to some of these questions around shortages leading to a glut that they don't believe. They say, okay, we'll give you credit for 26, but 27, you know, maybe we'll have too much and you're not going to need that. But it is interesting to me. And I think it's important to point out that your consensus forecast is that this won't happen, right? And we also put together forecast, you know, for the company, taking into account all of these numbers. Mm -hmm. And what it shows me is still, even though we're two and a half years into the age of AI, a massive divergence of belief mm -hmm. between what we hear Sam Altman saying, you saying, Sundar saying, Satya saying, and what Wall Street still believes. And, you know, again, you're comfortable with that. I but also don't think it's inconsistent. Okay, so explain that a little yeah. bit. So first of all, for the builders, we're supposed to be building for opportunity. Right. We're builders. Let me give you three points to think through. And these three points, it'll help you, hopefully, be more comfortable with NVIDIA in this future. So the first point, and this is the laws of physics point. This is the most important point, that general purpose computing is over, yes. and the future is accelerated computing yeah. and AI computing. Yeah. That's the first point. And so the way to think about that is there's how many trillions of dollars of computing infrastructures in the world that has to be refreshed. Right. And Before when it gets we, refreshed, it's going to be accelerated all, computing. That's right. And so the first thing you have to realize is that general purpose computing, and nobody disputes that. Everybody goes, yeah, we completely agree with that. General purpose computing is over. Moore's law is dead. People say these things. And so what does that mean? So general purpose computing is going to go to accelerated computing. Our partnership with Intel is recognizing that general purpose computing needs to be fused with accelerated computing to create opportunities for them. And so one, general purpose computing is shifting to accelerated computing and AI. Two, the first use case of AI is actually already everywhere. Right. It's in search, recommender engines. Mm. Isn't that right? In shopping. The basic hyperscale computing infrastructure used to be CPUs doing recommenders right. is now going to GPUs right. doing AI. So you just take classical computing, it's going to accelerate computing and AI. You take hyperscale computing, it's going from CPUs to accelerated computing and AI. And then now that's the second point. Just feeding the metas, the Googles, the ByteDances, the Amazons, right. and take their classical, traditional way of doing hyperscaling right. and moving into AI, yeah. that's hundreds of billions of dollars. And, and because that, that may be 4 billion people on the planet today, if you take TikTok, Meta into account, yeah. Google into account, who are already demanding workloads that are driven by accelerated that's, computing. That's exactly right. And so without even thinking about AI creating new opportunities, right. it's about AI shifting how you used to do something right. to the way new way of doing something, right. okay? And then now, let's talk about the future. Yeah. I just, so far, I've only spoken kind of largely about what just existed. mundane stuff. Just mundane stuff. The old way is now wrong. You're going to go, you're no longer going to use fuel light lanterns. You're going to go to electricity. And you no longer, you know, prop planes. You're going to go to jets. That's all. <laughs> and so far, yeah. you know, that's all I've talked about. And then, now that the incredible thing is, when you go to AI, when you go to accelerated computing, then what happens? What are the new applications that emerge as a result? And that's all the AI stuff that we're talking about. Yeah. And that's the, that opportunity, what, is it, how do, what does that look like? Well, the simple way of thinking about that is where motors replaced labor and physical activity, we now have AI, these AI supercomputers, these AI factories that I talk about, they're going to generate tokens 
to augment human intelligence, right? And human intelligence represents what? 55, 65% of the world's GDP, let's call it $50 trillion. Mm -hmm. And that $50 trillion is going to get augmented by something. Suppose I were to hire a $100,000 employee, and I augmented that $100,000 employee with a $10,000 AI. Yes. And that $10,000 AI, as a result, made the $100,000 employee twice more productive, right. three times more productive would I do it. Right. Heartbeat. Yeah. I, I'm doing it across every single person in our company right now, mm -hmm. right? Every single software engineer, every single chip designer in our company already has AIs working with them. 100% mm -hmm. coverage. As a result, the number of chips we're building is better. The pay, pace at which we're doing it is, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're growing faster as a company. As a result, we're hiring more people. Our productivity is greater. Our top line is greater. What's not to love about that? Yeah. Now, apply the NVIDIA story to the world's GDP. And so what's likely to happen is that that $50 trillion is augmented by, let's pick a number, mm. $10 trillion. Right. That $10 trillion needs to run on a machine. Mm. Now, the reason that AI is different than IT in the past, in the way software was written a priori, and then it runs on a CPU. And it doesn't, it runs, it, a person would operate it. In the future, of course, AI is generating tokens, but a machine has to generate the tokens and it's thinking. Yeah. So that software is running all the time, whereas in the past, the software was written once. Now the software is, in fact, writing all the time. It's thinking. Yeah. In order for the AI to think, it needs a factory. And so let's say that that $10 trillion of token generated, 50% yeah. gross margins, and $5 trillion of it needs a factory, right. needs an AI infrastructure. Right. So if you told me, that on an annual basis, the cap X of the world was about $5 trillion. Yeah. I would say the math seems to make sense. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the future, right? Yeah. The dis going from Excel general purpose computing to accelerated computing, yeah. replacing all the hyperscales with AI, and then now augmenting human intelligence for the mm -hmm. world's GDP. And today that market is about, our estimate is about $400 billion annually. So the TAM you know, is a four to five X increase yeah. over where it is today. Eddie last night, Eddie Wu at Alibaba said, between now and the end of the decade, they're going to increase their data center power by 10 X, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're going to increase power by 10 X. And we, we correlate to power. NVIDIA's revenue is almost correlated to power. Isn't that right? Yeah. That's right. Because uh, another laws, thing, what else did he say? Yeah. He said token generation is doubling every few months. The perf per watt has to keep on going exponentially. That's why NVIDIA is like cranking it out with perf per watt. Mm. And revenue per watt is, you know, watt is basically revenues in this future. Hans, I want to take you back to the beginning of that clip. What on earth were those analysts' revenue expectations? We have Jensen on the one hand talking about an insatiable level of demand for compute for AI products, and then analysts predicting single-digit revenue growth. What do you make of that? Well, it almost makes you laugh at how short-sighted analysts on Wall Street really can be. But then as retail investors, we need to go a level deeper and ask the question, why is it that Wall Street is so nearsighted? And the answer is really actually pretty simple. For the most part, these analysts are not investing their own money. They don't really have upside to gain from being right about a bullish long-term call. But they certainly do hear about it if they make a bullish call and they're wrong, and those returns don't actually materialize. And they definitely get penalized when they don't see a crash coming. So this is kind of a classic principal agent problem where these analysts just do not have the correct set of incentives in place, or at the very least, they don't have the same set of incentives that you or I have when we're investing our own money. And then when you layer in on top of the fact that they're pretty much all evaluated on a quarterly basis, and at the most, they might look out 12 months, well, then you realize why these analysts are only looking at 2026 revenues for NVIDIA. Yes, 2027 is going to happen. And yes, it looks like that'll be a great year for them. But their spreadsheets literally only go out to the end of 26. So what do they put for growth expectations in the year 2027? It's just a placeholder. And it doesn't really matter if it's low or high because they're not really factoring that into the time frame that they care about, which is much shorter than maybe you or I care about. And so if you combine that with the PTSD that Wall Street certainly has and much of the investing world has from the dot-com boom and bust cycle, you can see why so many people who make a living giving other people advice 
end up being extra conservative. And to give them their due, you know, they're right. There is a chance that growth in 2027 for NVIDIA won't materialize in the double digits. Maybe it will only be single digits. I just think that that probability is very, very low. While possible, I don't think that's what's going to happen. And that gap in between my expectation of what is likely and what Wall Street is willing to price in is the opportunity that retail investors like us have to beat the market, to beat the S&P 500, and to beat the NASDAQ, which is what I've done very successfully over the past decade by picking the correct tech stocks and the correct management teams that really do have an edge. I know you have a hot take here, Hans, so I'm going to set you up for it. Jensen said general computing is over. You told me that means Moore's law is dead. Please, can you explain to me and the audience why this is actually incredibly, incredibly important? It might get a bit nerdy, but this ultimately leads to more and bigger when it comes to data centers. Well, unfortunately, I do need to start with the disclaimer for this very technical audience that no, I'm not saying that Moore's Law is literally dead, even though maybe it is slowing down, maybe transistors are not doubling in density every two years, maybe it's a little bit more than two years. But that's not really what Jensen's saying, and that's not really what I'm saying either. When Jensen says that the era of general computing is over, what he's talking about is that the center of gravity in growth in computation has moved away from the CPU and towards parallel accelerated computing, mostly for artificial intelligence. And so even NVIDIA, they currently build their CPUs, they integrate them into their systems, they have just recently done this deal with Intel. And so CPU architecture, general computing based on CPUs is a workload within computing that is going to actually continue to grow. And maybe even the growth of general computing will be accelerated by the growth of accelerated computing. But the center of gravity within computation has definitely shifted away from general computing. And that is why Moore's Law metaphorically is dead and Jensen Wong is the one who killed it. Furthermore, I think this is actually a good thing for the economy as a whole. You know, Peter Thiel has this famous quote and it says, we were promised flying cars, but instead all we got was 140 characters. And his point for many years now has been that growth in the physical side of the economy basically flatlined in the 1970s and that all of the GDP growth since then, for the most part, has been accounted for by the world of bits, things that happen on screens, and not necessarily the atoms that make up the world around us. And I think there are many factors to this, but one of the most underappreciated reasons is just the power of Moore's Law to begin with, which really started to become a major force in the economy in the 1970s. Moore's Law gave us free performance growth in computing, and the only atoms that ever had to get better in that paradigm were the atoms that lived inside of the silicon fabs. That meant that the world was able to enjoy the benefits of growth on the back of computing every year without necessarily having to build any more power or any more infrastructure. And that actually persisted all the way up until the 1990s and early 2000s when we ended up having to do a significant build out of infrastructure to actually facilitate the networking layer of computing globally, and that is where the internet comes from. And so that infrastructure build out consisted of a lot of fiber, a lot of lines, a lot of switches, a lot of networking equipment, but really all of that infrastructure was actually built out inside of this bits economy much more so than atoms. Even though there was an atom component to it, it was really the minority of what was going on there, whereas the majority of it just had to do with, hey, we've actually got enough processing power now to where we can create these networks and transmit data that really goes beyond just what telephones are able to carry. Now we can transmit much richer forms of data, including text and video and computer graphics, high fidelity audio, etc. So this actually created this very odd equilibrium of GDP growth on the back of computing growth that was perfectly in tune with what Moore's Law was able to provide us with. Not really more and not really less. Which is the reason that electricity generation here in the United States has largely been flatlined over the last number of decades. 
But now with the advent of accelerated computing, all of this has been changed dramatically. Under the new accelerated computing paradigm, the demand for compute growth is actually far exceeding what Moore's law can supply. So Jensen and NVIDIA have had to get deeply vertically integrated to become computing systems engineers, and they've had to reinvent the entire data center stack from GPUs to CPUs to networking to power delivery and cooling even. This allows them to grow performance per watt much faster than Moore's law, but that in turn drives computing demand growth that's even faster than what they're able to deliver with their performance per watt growth. And this is the fundamental reason why we are continuing to demand more watts of compute every year. And we can see this just by observing the sizes of data centers that continue to get built out. It used to be that a megawatt size data center was huge. Now, Elon is on the way to building the world's first gigawatt scale supercomputer with Colossus 2, and he's not the only one who's shooting for that. OpenAI and Microsoft and Meta all have their own plans to do something similar, although they likely won't be able to deliver those at the same time and speed that Elon does. But are we going to stop there? Probably not it's very likely that we're going to see the first 10 gigawatt data center built out before 2030. So what we're seeing is an exponential demand growth for computing that drives exponential demand growth for power that in turn drives up demand for lots of other things as well. So this exponential demand growth that we're seeing for electricity to power these AI data centers is what brings us back full circle to Peter Thiel's analogy about the decoupling between GDP growth that is based solely on bits and screens and ties it back in to the real economy with real atoms in the real world. There's just no way for us to build out all of the electricity generation that's going to be required to power the next 10 years worth of AI infrastructure without moving atoms on a massive scale. And this is why we see demand for so many trades growing. We're going to need more electricians, more plumbers, more welders, more construction workers, more buildings, more roads, all just to build out data centers. And then once we've built out the data centers, we're going to need all sorts of new factories and raw materials in order to produce the robots that will then be able to provide an embodiment for all of this intelligence that we are going to produce. Before we wrap, I have to say a huge thank you to my co-host, David. Besides being a great co-host with a great accent, David has been one of the key figures behind the scenes helping me to grow this channel from 1,000 to over 16,000 subscribers and to put out regular shows that reach millions of views every year. When he's not moonlighting with me, he usually works with businesses who want to leverage YouTube to grow their online presence, and he's looking to take on more. If you want to get more clients and more brand awareness for your business using YouTube, I definitely recommend him. You can book a free call with him using the link in the description below.